what keeps bringing them back, you know? And it's, it's, um... It's that fighting games are great. Fighting games are great, and I, I really do have, I want to repeat a quote from our good friend Z, because mm. he said this a few years ago, and it's always been one of my favorite quotes. And, you know, you wonder why these people come back and year after year to play. And he said, Evo is love. Yeah. L-O-V-E, if when you hold that L and run it back, Evo. Yeah. And that is the best way to put it. Evo is love that people come back because this event is unlike anything else in the entire video game world. Yeah, I mean, it's been an incredible year. Thanks for joining me as always, James. It was good to have the tears this year. Yeah. Bring it in. All right, and thank you guys. Thank you, everybody at home, for watching. And we will see you again next year for Evo 2018. Hey guys, just before we go into the interview, I wanted to let you know that I've got 10 interviews from Combo Breaker, which I'll be premiering at 12 p.m. Eastern Time every day on my Twitch channel, Born Free Twitch, ideally, unless I'm running late. Keep an eye on my Twitter, Born Free Tweets. If you haven't seen this video, I'm doing a six-week experiment with content, uh, which could be the beginning of something special, or it just could be the end of my general production with FGC content. Either way, it's fine. I just don't like being in limbo. Much like I love the FGC, uh, we all know how it is. If you want me to be that FGC guy who, for instance, interviews one person, you know, every weekday, for instance, on Skype or what have you, I will let you know at the end of the video how to lend me your support more directly. In the meantime, enjoy this video. If you like it, give it a like because it helps with the trending. Hey guys, Born Free here. Welcome back to my channel. I'm here with James Chen at Combo Breaker on Friday. How the hell are you? I'm doing good so far. Just had a four hour block of commentary, but you know, it was all good matches. So having a good time as usual. So four hours, what's that like? You know what? I mean, to be honest with you, like four hours sounds like it's bad, but compared to what it used to be a long time ago. I mean, the, the, the worst block I think David and I ever did was the 25th anniversary where we did Super Turbo, Street Fighter 4, and Street Fighter Cross Tekken like back to back for like 12 hours with no breaks or something like that. And yeah, nothing will ever be that again. So. Right, if you've done that, you can definitely do four hours. You're like, yeah, you're like, four hours already? What are you talking about? All right, so, uh, you are one of those people who I'm like, I don't even know where to start, man. And I don't know where to finish, you know, like, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like, this may as well be Game of Thrones season one and we'll, and we'll follow up with season two, like in a week or something, you know, like, so I've picked a few things, but, but I think I'm only going to be scratching the surface. And also, you know, the other intimidating thing about interviewing someone like you is that, that you're actually already out there and talking you know you got your own show and all that sort of stuff so i guess where i want to start is at the beginning <laughs> uh so i want to start with like little james chen oh, right because i don't know if i know i certainly don't know this story mm -hmm. but little james chen like like where did you where did you grow up and then when did you first come in contact with fighting games mm, man uh i was actually born in southern california so i am a uh, first generation abc american born chinese mm -hmm. and uh yeah I, I grew up in uh san bernardino area which is a little further inland from los angeles so you just go about like another like 80 90 miles east of los angeles and i'm just kind of over there and uh i mean growing up i was just into games for my whole entire life you know mm. i was and i was uh, even as a kid i got salty too i mean i there's the story where uh the first game of checkers i played with my dad and my older brother i lost and i flipped the board because i was so mad you know so i've been this way my whole life uh but you know i've been playing board games like i played board games all the time when i was a kid and i was super competitive in those i would get mad every time i lost and everything and then video games just started coming around and it was just kind of like a natural progression yeah. from board games and you know before video games were all one player stuff right yeah. there wasn't a lot of competitive stuff but then 
uh, my older brother was going to UCLA at the time. And UCLA had just the most amazing arcade at the time. And Street Fighter 2 came out while he was there. And he was like, dude, James, you got to check out this new game. This is called Street Fighter 2 and whatever. And people were only playing it against the computer anyway. They weren't even playing against each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. And so we found an arcade near where um, our parents lived. And then I would go visit my brother at, on campus and head to the arcade and play there. So I just started getting into Street Fighter 2 very early on, just like from the get-go. But it mostly started because my brother was telling me all about it because uh, he had it at his arcade. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Ashley, did you play... What were you playing before that? Like, what were the earliest video games you were playing? Because I remember freaking... My grandparents had, like, the ping pong or whatever the hell that ping pong game was yeah <laughs> pong i think it was yeah, yeah, yeah. they like literally had a whole console dedicated to pong yeah, yeah. right and that was really old school then I, I had an atari with like pitfall and all that crap yeah. like well what did you have what were you playing i mean so the reason why i started getting into video games was my parents owned a chinese restaurant yeah. and on mondays that was the day where the waitresses all had their days off so when our mom picked us up from school, she didn't have time to drop us off at home and had to take us directly to the restaurant where she worked as the waitress for the day. Uh -huh. And then when she was done, then she would take us home. Mm -hmm. But we would get bored there because we're just two kids and, you know, there's no, no such thing as portable consoles back then or anything. I mean, you know, there was nothing back then. <laughs> and, uh, but there was a mini mall across the street that had a Aladdin's castle and a little arcade over there that had a bunch of video games over there. So our mom would give us a dollar and we would walk over there and we would get two quarters each mm. to go and play video games over there. And so, you know, man, I can tell you, like, I started on a game called Starhawk, which is this old vector graphics game, which you couldn't die in. It was just based on a timer. And then I started getting into games like Dig Dug. And then I started playing all these just crazy elevator action. I played this game called Flicky. I used to be really into the Journey video game in the arcade. And eventually, like, I became one of the best at, like, Dragon's Lair at the arcade. Are you good, at, you good at that game? I couldn't figure that game out. Yeah. So I was the kid that I would play the game. There was five lives. Yeah. I would get to the very last stage. And because the last stage was the longest, yeah. you got the most points for it. So I would get all the points, get to the last move, kill myself. Uh, do the last stage again, get to the last move, kill myself, do that all the way until the last life so I could right. max out the points, wow. yeah. Oh, wow. And then Super Mario Brothers eventually came out on the in the arcades. And people don't know this, but Super Mario Brothers in the arcade was 10 times harder than it was Isn't on... Isn't that Donkey Kong or Super Mario Brothers? Super Mario Brothers. Okay, yeah, it was so much harder in the arcade okay. than it was at, in the home version. And I, like, beat that as... A, I mean, I was a little kid running around with a stool. Because yeah. I couldn't reach the joysticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's this little kid on a stool playing Super Mario Brothers, beating it. And I just had this crowd of people watching me because they were like, yeah. look at this little kid beating games. That's fine. And then, you know, I did have an Atari 2600. I was obsessed with adventure yeah. on, that, on that console. But then eventually the Nintendo came out. And then that's just kind of when the whole gaming thing just mm. went nuts at that point. So... Yeah, we, yeah. We, I didn't have an Nintendo, I had, an, I had a Sega, but yeah, that was a, I used to go and play Duck Hunt in the local, <laughs> yeah. there was a shop where you could play Duck Hunt, so everyone, all the kids just used to go there, it was actually a pharmacy, or a chemist in the UK, and used to go upstairs in the beauty department, and then there was electronics department, and then all of a sudden there was just Duck Hunt, and everyone yeah. could play it, <laughs> it was like, you know, it was cool, um, so you got into fighting games, um, so let's talk about James Chen, the player, Okay. Right, because you got into fighting games, and then, like, it seems like California was an extremely good place to be in regards to like, uh, you know, the fighting game community or something that developed into a community or whatever. What, what, uh, when did you start competing, and what characters were you playing, and and how successful were you? I mean, very early on, it was like me and my brother and like a couple of other guys were the best at that local arcade that we found mm. uh, in San Bernardino. And we thought we were the best. Like, yeah. we were just like, oh, my gosh, we're so good and whatever. And, you know, the, the infamous Tomo Ohira. Yes. Right. Yes. And uh, there was four. Is he in your arcade? 
Uh, he wasn't in our arcade, uh, okay. but uh, they were in a place that was closer to Los Angeles uh, called Pico Rivera at a world's finest comics. And uh, they actually started driving around all of Southern California to let people know about the tournament. And they visited our arcade. Oh, wow. And uh, like I said, we thought we were the hot shit, right? Mm -hmm. And then he, him and another player named Tony Tsui came out, and they just wrecked us. Like, it was... Like, to this day, I still think one of the coolest moments is when you find out you suck at a video game because mm. it's like, oh my God, the whole world is opening up. Like, mm. I, there's so much more to learn about this game, you know? And that was kind of like the moment that we had when they just blew us up because we thought we were so good. Mm. And so we eventually went and visited that Pico Rivera tournament. And, you know, I've always described it as like, you know, in those James Bond films when you walk into Q's lab and you see all the crazy, like, technology and everything. That's kind of how it felt when we went there because people were just doing things in that game that we just didn't even think was possible it just wow. opened up our eyes to a whole new world and so you know from there i was never like one of the best at the fighting games you know I, I, through hyper fighting i had a friend uh, named roger sahavo who uh basically had a hyper fighting cabinet in his home mm. so we would go there in the summer and oh, you did? Uh, yeah like yeah it was crazy he just had a his parents i think uh got it for him i don't remember i remember back in those days like those are expensive yeah. i've never asked how i was just happy he had it yeah. so yeah so we would go there play eat a bunch of uh you know pizza and uh his mom would make uh, rice crispy treats for everybody and it was amazing yeah that sounds and amazing but uh, even then, like, I wasn't super competitive until I finally ended up going to UCLA myself. Mm. And once I went there, uh, I was just playing every day. I, I mean, like, I was... I was that kid that tried to be good at school, but I kept ditching classes to stay at the mm. arcade and keep playing. You know, you would lose and get salty, and you're like, five minutes to class, one more game, one more game, and you know, you know how that goes. Yeah, <laughs> I can skip this class. I'll ask my friend for well, the notes. You know. I mean, yeah, university is. I remember it well because like my dad said something really stupid to me. I've never had this conversation with him. If he sees this video, he'll know. <laughs> but he, I think he was trying to be cool at the time, or or he was trying to relieve my stress. But I was heading off to university and he said to me, I was like really stressed I was like well, I think everyone's just gonna be fuck you know everyone's gonna be nerds and like <laughs> that like 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 they're gonna be really like into that not like nerds like video game nerds right, like they're gonna be like yeah. really into their work and like they're gonna be like super intellectuals and like I had this really warped view of what university was and he was like Mark don't worry all you do at university is go to the pub and I took <laughs> I, I actually he doesn't know this but like I took that as a green light to just get drunk a lot uh, you know <laughs> so i wasn't heading to the arcade i was heading i was like another drink and okay today's so we're not doing today forget today but um i i, I was the real nerd in college yeah, yeah, <laughs> different type of nerd yeah 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 the video game nerd oh yeah, yeah. Um, i mean all my best friends in college were from that arcade so a bunch of them i still talk to today you know so with the, the tomo thing right because you always talk about tomo right okay mm -hmm. um did you become friends with Tomo like was he going to the same arcades as you or, or was it always like he was just known in the area as the best yeah, no I, I never really got to know Tomo personally we just okay. knew of him like I don't even know if he knows who I am you know mm -hmm. I, you know so he was just part of that elite crew of that you know those guys that played it was like him Tony uh, there was another guy named uh, shoot I can't remember all the names now uh, there was a Roger Chung, and then there was uh, one more guy. Ah, I can't remember his name right now. I always forget the fourth guy's name, but they were the gods, and a bunch of them would just play over there, and we always just kind of saw them as this elite group that we couldn't really touch. And, like, back then, I mean, in the arcade days, it really just was you won't, you didn't talk to people until they could start beating you. You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it was. I mean, my experience was different to yours, but, I like, I didn't even really take it seriously mm -hmm. you know i think you guys took it more seriously yeah. uh, because it seemed like you started to get on messaging forums and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. pretty early on like I, I was just like it's a game you know if i'm good at it i'm good at it if i'm not i'm not like i'll try to get better I, I i was 
considered good in within my group of friends and i even remember one guy coming to my house because it was like this person knows this person and <laughs> you know like we played it on the super nintendo and i beat course, i remember when everyone was there i beat him and then they all left and we did casuals and like i didn't win a single match <laughs> because that was like how i operated i right. guess like i like i think that's i could only concentrate for like you know those games okay but um the i wanted to ask you a little bit about tomo like is there any way to put tomo into context like can you compare him to someone nowadays because like everyone's like tomo 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 but then you're like i don't know how to contextualize it because uh, it, you know it's like a it's a legendary guy in the past i know there was a video that mm -hmm. capcom made with him and i have uh, that's another question i have and i don't know if you have the answer is like how did capcom know this is the guy that oh, we should yeah. be that should be in this video talking about street fire <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. like no i mean he he was so i mean just kind of the, at the time that he was playing it he was just so far ahead of everybody i mean there's a lot of stories uh gerald abraham who runs the okamoto kitchen food truck that i'm always retweeting and stuff but he used to play with tomo and you know he would tell me stories about how like capcom ran an official tournament and like they released the street fighter pinball machine and like tomo like flipped the score like the first time he played it or something like that he he was just really good at video games and it's funny because i still remember the first time i saw him play like uh it was the first time we went to that pico rivera tournament and he beat a chun li player by only using light kick with guile and i was like what that's crazy and then you know if chun li did low roundhouse he uppercut it like every single time and if she didn't do it he wouldn't whiff uppercuts and i was like how is he doing this and you know nowadays it's funny because like i i kind of can piece together what he was doing because we just understand fighting games so much better the game was slower there's a lot of like confirmation tricks that you can use and things like that but he was just so ahead of his time he just knew all those tricks he could figure out those tricks before anyone else could you know i'm not sure how he did it or or just why his brain worked that way i mean i know you know i i have debates with people about this all the time i i truly believe if tomo was playing nowadays and knew that the money existed and had access to training mode and all that stuff like that he would be one of the best i i, I don't think he would be like the best clearly but he would definitely be able to compete with everyone if he had just kept playing because I don't know. There's just some sort of savant factor to him, and everybody was playing this game. I mean, back then, Street Fighter Two, everybody was. You could go to a random yeah. store, and everybody yeah. was good at the game. They were doing all the high-level stuff because you had to in order to play. And um, eventually, you know, Capcom would throw their own tournaments, and Tomo would go there and play, and he would win a lot of those tournaments. And so Capcom knew of him from there. And, uh, you know, and I think uh, he had a manager at Pico Rivera. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, like, I think they worked it out for as a deal to have him do that video with yeah. the with the 80s guy in, yeah. the, in the backwards cap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But there was just something about the way Tomo played that I just felt like was he was just he just knew a bunch of stuff that we know now. But he knew it back then before anyone else did. It's crazy. Oh, great game, Tomo. Thanks, you're getting better. Thanks. That's because along with all these great strategies, Tomo's taught me a method called the TDR. Timing, distance, and reactions. You need to pay attention to timing. By that I mean the timing of your attacks and counters. You need to know your distances. Know what moves will counterattack from a given distance. Once you got the timing and distance down, you can concentrate on the R. Reaction. You need to develop reflexes so that you can react to what your opponent does automatically. So in other words, you have to practice to the point where the moves and combinations are second nature. So you can go beyond the technique and study the psychology of your opponent. Right, right. Then you can psych your opponents out with stuff you know they won't be expecting. You know, the same thing I'm always doing to you. I'm starting to hate this guy. Don't worry. This tape is going to give you tons of psych out strategies. I'm starting to like this guy. It's instinctively understood, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. That's kind of how I think about Sonic, but the yes. but I but I still need to talk to Sonic about his his early days because I, I'm not sure. I don't know if he sees the Matrix or or if he's a hard worker or if he's both. You know. <laughs> I mean, 
to be honest with you, you know, speaking about Sonic Fox, I just think he was just born into fighting games because his older brother played fighting mm. games. Quiggle uh, is like a, one of the top uh, DOA mm. players. And so I feel like Sonic Fox was probably playing him ever since he was a little kid. And so he's just been playing fighting games probably, you know, since he can first memory or whatever, you know. So I just think his brain has just been shaped and honed in that direction. And so at this point in time, I, I feel like it is kind of like the Matrix for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do too. I do too. Uh, I mean, he certainly picks up really quickly. Now, which was your favorite? Do you still do you have like a favorite game? A uh, fighting game yeah. or a uh, fighting game? It's Super Turbo is still my favorite. Uh, oh, I, yeah, Super Street Fighter Two Turbo because uh, you know that was the game that I first got really like stronger in, and yeah, you did. Okay. and it was it was also kind of like it's where I you know met Cammy essentially, right? And okay. I used her because yes. she. She yeah. was the worst character in the game. Mm -hmm. I was a low-tier hero back then. I uh, always wanted to play the worst character because it felt good to beat people up with the bad characters. Yeah. And then at the same time, if you lost, you had the excuse. Yeah yeah, 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 the option select. And so I played Cammy, and I got really known for playing Cammy. I was one of the only ones playing her. And to this day, like for me, uh, I feel like I can't be good at a fighting game unless I keep playing it. I have to keep playing it and keep it in my brain. So nowadays, because I'm playing Playing like 19,000 fighting games mm. like I can't get good at any of them mm. but Super Turbo I will never forget mm. like to this day like yeah, I can see yeah bike, right? I can never forget how to play Super Turbo at this point in time and so it's just that game is just it's also suits kind of the way that I think about fighting games the way that I want to play it's a very emotional game a lot of games these days are more mathematical more scientific but Super Turbo was just like it's just I feel like doing this right now and I'm gonna do it and that's what makes that game so much fun for me so I have a question which is kind of I mean, it's related to favorite game but it, it might be the you know it might be that you have a different answer uh, are there mechanics because you've played so many games right do you are there any f m fundamental mechanics in games that are your favorite uh, that, that stand out to you as like so for instance uh, actually you know what just narrow it down let's say there's a new, new Street Fighter uh -huh. mm -hmm. right what sort of mechanics would you like to see implemented like if it were, you were like head de game designer what would you <laughs> what would you want to see implemented in that game I mean, I would put back Invincible Uppercuts. <laughs> uh, I love Invincible Uppercuts. I think they change a lot of the way games are played. Also, I really do miss projectiles being very powerful. Zoning, yeah. Yes, because yeah. Super Turbo, the projectiles are so powerful. So what happened was a lot of times when you look at a fighting game, uh, most fighting games these days are kind of close range based, right? But this full screen distance isn't as impactful as it is as it was back in the street fighter 2 days Not, back then being full screen away was its own game and then when you would get closer it was like kind of a different game and different characters would play different ways that way and i kind of miss that aspect you know of of having the distance matter that much more I, I feel like there's some games like nrs does a good job with that well i mean mk11 doesn't have as much as owners but like injustice 2 had some really good zoners and everything so i really was you know fond of that kind of uh you know uh game design and i feel like the the projectiles have gotten weaker and you know i understand why because people feel like oh oh my god, you can't play for real, you're just throwing fireballs, you're not actually fighting, you know, and it, it makes people salty and it makes people mad, but, you know, I, I honestly do miss the, the, the strong projectile play and the, you know, I've got full screen Honda headbutt and Blanca charge moves, you mm. know, and, you know, just having the full screen distance still be a viable distance for fighting. And so I would probably try to bring back a little bit, like some characters that are stronger zoning, some characters who have, you know, really good, you know, control of the whole screen and everything like that. Because even though I like playing rushdown characters, zoning characters always kind of fascinated me in a weird way. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's weird. I, th I think that's, uh, it's art. It's, it's, yeah. it's an art form. It's a skill. It's something that you learn, you know. Um, on that, 
they had asked Daigo the same. I say they, the stream mm -hmm. stream monsters had asked Daigo the same question. I saw this on FGC translated. Oh, like okay. everyone loves that new channel. Go check it out. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, what do you want to see in Street Fighter Six? And he had said he didn't want to see like the comeback mechanic. Like, oh, right. he, you know, obviously there's one in Street Fighter. Four, and then there's a much much bigger one in Street Fighter Five yeah. to the point where like when I used to play Akuma I used to be like hit me mm -hmm. because then we start you know um, how do you feel about the comeback mechanic do you do you think it's hype or not hype it can be hype what do you I mean what are your thoughts it's interesting because the comeback mechanic honestly is a viewer friendly mechanic but it's a player unfriendly mechanic mm. you know for viewers i think uh comeback mechanics are amazing i mean x factor and marvel versus capcom 3 was one of the biggest combat you know crazy mm. comeback factors and the audience would go nut nuts when you saw someone do a one character you know x factor comeback but the players would just be like oh god i'm so <laughs> mad. i'm so mad about this you know so i think there's a good balance between the two you know, uh, for me, again, you know, growing up in the Street Fighter 2 games, I always joke that the comeback mechanic in those games is the game because just the damage is so high. Like, mm -hmm. uh, the stun was basically kind of like the comeback factor in those games because if Ken hit you with a low short, that could be it in hyper fighting. Like, he could be losing the match down to another, like a pixel, and you have a full health bar, and then he throws you once, and he hits you with a low short, and you don't block that when you get up, you're dead. That's it. The game is, the, the round is over it's just because the damage is so high. So, but I mean, I, as a player, like I would want, I would want to find the right balance as a player and as a person who would like to see more viewers get into the game. The comeback mechanic, I feel like, has to be less blatant. You know what I mean? And it, I, I, it's, a, I don't know, like I, the player inside me is like, you know, screw comeback mechanics. I hate them. They're dumb. But the, as the person who, you know, is hoping to, you know, have a lot more people watch it and get hype about it and everything like that. You know, it's in every fighting game for a reason. You always see people get kind of hype about it, you know. Mm. And not only that, but it makes play like the, the casual players feel like they always have a chance, right? Mm. The, 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 at the highest levels, it's kind of annoying. But like at the low levels, you're always like, because like right now in Mortal Kombat 11, like I'm not a particularly strong player in that game. But Fatal Blow is just like super easy to, you know, just, just hit three buttons and there it is you know so like i'm losing these matches and i'll just like walk up to someone and fatal blow and i hit them and i'm like yeah. yes i'm the best you know and like really i'm not but <laughs> so i mean there's a interesting balance there's a very uh okay. crucial balance that i feel like developers need to look at and just make sure that it's not super blatant of a comeback mechanic you know that it's just not like this kind of robbery thing that is unearned like if there's a good way to make it so that it's an earnable comeback factor, you know, that it's, it's, it is a comeback factor, but you st it still requires some sort of skill and high level skill and strategy to, to, to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would, that would make a lot of players happier, even at the high levels as well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we're not going to solve it. His thing here, yeah. but like it takes experimentation and people sitting in, devs sitting in uh, rooms and brainstorming and testing and this and that and the other. Uh, I, I do want to add, though, you know, kind of going on what Daigo saying and the question about what you'd like to see in Street Fighter VI. One thing I do like about the Street Fighter series is that every version is a different game. Yeah. And, I, you know, as much as I'm a big Super Turbo fan and all that stuff like that, I just hope Street Fighter VI can do something very unique to itself. You know, like Street Fighter Three is the is the parries like they changed everything you know the way that the game plays mm. and you know street fighter 4 was you know had all these defensive options 5 is just more about this raw kind of you know uh constant rps to the game you know and like they all have a different feel and they're all valid in my opinion so the only thing i would like to see most out of six is that it's not like any of the older games that it is its own kind of feel that it's its own right. beast yeah right yeah, it's interesting because I see a lot of people uh, sort of saying, Remake 3, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, so I guess we'll see what happens. Um, I, I hope there's something in the works, you know? Because <laughs> I'm a Capcom fanboy, I am, you know? I just hope, I, but I'm fine with them taking their time, like, to get it right. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about, uh, before we talk about commentary, let's just talk about five real quick. It just... 
I want to know now that G's been out for a while, now that Kage's been out for a while, what, got any feelings about those characters? Any strong feelings? Like, you know, do you, some people say G is broken, his V trigger <laughs> is broken. Right. Other people are saying Kage is weak, you know, and like, what do you feel about those characters? I mean, I think G is amazing. <laughs> I think he's super good. Yeah. I think people are kind of sleeping on him. Like, he has bad defense, sure, but a lot of characters have bad defense in this game. And uh, I, I, the, the ability for G just to basically steal rounds, I think, is just otherworldly. So I'm, I'm glad to see guys like Gustavo really kind of uh, showing what the character can do. Uh, we've seen Nephew do amazing things with G on the Street Fighter League. Yeah. So I think that character is really, really... Do I think he's top tier, like one of the best? Probably not, but he's definitely a tournament viable character in my opinion. Like if this is the only character you play, you can definitely win a tournament with him. You know, he'll have a bad matchup here or there. Um, as for Kage, I mean, I don't think he's terrible. I know a lot of some people are thinking he's the worst character in the game or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this happens every single time in Street Fighter V. A new character comes out and nobody knows what to do with them. And mm -hmm. they're like, this character's not very good. And so Capcom buffs them a, lot, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then they turn out to be, like, supremely broken, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it's happened so much. It happened with... Uh, I mean, heck, it happened with Rashid when he first came out because he was so unique. Everyone thought he was bad. He didn't do damage. Yes. And then all of a sudden, uh, John Takauchi was doing amazing with him, mm. even at the end of season one. Then he got buffed in season two, and then he was amazing. Mm. Balrog and Yurian, people said, were okay. They buffed him slightly, and then they were amazing. Mm. Laura kind of said that. It always seems to work out that way. And so I, I, you know, I'm still thinking that people probably still haven't explored Kage enough, that there might be more to him mm. than we know. But... Uh, do I think he might actually be like top tier? Like I don't think he'll be as good as G, for example. Um, I think he has too many inherent weaknesses, but I I don't think he's bad by any stretch. Well, I, I think what's interesting about him is that no one's playing him. Like, <laughs> like so, like like it's like I just interviewed Ran Rangchu, who played, who won Tekken World Tour with Panda, right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, part of me is amazed that he you know this this character suits his style and he he said he's literally like i i can't move like my movement's terrible so i use this <laughs> why i use panda and it's like oh okay, well you're playing you're, you're playing to your strengths and and but then again there's also this element of does the other do these other guys ever get to play against a half decent panda and so i'm hopefully gonna I don't know, guys, but like I'm going to try and talk to Sarko about Kage because he's the only person I think who's played Kage at a reasonably high level, and um, that that would if he busts Kage out every now and then, and you can tell that whoever he's playing is probably thinking <laughs> is probably thinking. Mm, I'm not yeah. sure, you know. I'm not Look, I, like I said, I played low tier my whole life yeah. until one point, right? But like Super Turbo, I get away with so many wins with Cami because I know my opponent hasn't played a lot of Camis, yeah. you know? Yeah. I just know they're not familiar with it because I can almost teach them how to beat me like right, right away, right, right. but I never do. It's like because that's of, not yeah, real. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I'll never forget when. Um, I mean, like, I think Sian is a genius, but uh, I'll never forget when Sian played Takedo in the, when he won Evo, oh and he was Gen, mm -hmm. and, and I remember Takedo was like, <laughs> yeah, I remember he was like, yeah. he was like running, he was like running <laughs> back, he was like 20 Japanese, I was right, there, yeah, yeah. I think I was there, oh, it might be Evo, I wasn't there, but there was like 20 Japanese yeah. people like by the stage, and he'd like run up to them between rounds or whatever, like, who, which, what, what, am like, to what am I supposed to do, <laughs> right. what I, and nobody knew, right, yeah, and so there's definitely something to be said for like picking a character where the other person has mm -hmm. no clue, mm -hmm. and I remember, I remember I predicted Sen was going to pick Fong, when we started Street Fighter uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I had the interview with him and I was like did you pick Fong because because like you've seen success with characters that right. people, other people don't understand I can't remember exactly what I said but he was like yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it makes total sense I mean we saw that final round earlier this year when Smug and Gustavo were beating a bunch of guys with G, right? right? And the Japanese even admitted, they're like, we weren't even sure of like all the crazy things he was capable of doing. And you can right. tell they've studied him a lot more now. So yeah. even yeah. in this day of the internet, it's still, it's still <laughs> happening. You know, like it was, it was, it was, it was, a hundred times worse than that like back you oh, know yeah, like yeah. when like suddenly the japanese would just come over and be like watch me parry this channel like yeah. uh 
<laughs> you know, once you check but parry this channel e super full yeah. you thought that was impossible no it's not i'll tell you right now evo 2002 when we had the 5v5 third strike exhibition japan versus us yeah. Yeah. i mean watson was still using uh super art three sorai rengeki for yun because we didn't even know about ganajin and, right. then, and then like master came and just like ganajin to everybody and we're like what is going <laughs> on you know like because we couldn't ha we didn't have footage of it we just didn't see it you yeah. know it was so hard to to see what other people were doing back then that's wild that's wild um all right so let's i'm gonna let's talk about commentary a little bit sure. uh so at some point you made the transition to commentary i guess or maybe there was probably a player commentary section and now it's more just commentary um like what do you find is this what do you find easiest about commentary and what do you find most challenging about commentary personally um wow uh for i guess the easiest part of commentary is just i'm just actually such a fan of like the players mm. and the games mm. and everything and i just i genuinely love fighting games so a lot of times when i'm just doing commentary and i get kind of excited and stuff like that mm. i mean that's just it's just that's genuine excitement yes. you know I've, I've told people like who want to become commentators i was just just make sure you love the game yeah, you know yeah. and and just you know try to make sure that you're expressing why what these guys are doing is amazing mm. you know because having played it before sometimes these guys make decisions and i'm just like what the heck like how did you even think of trying that you know and when that happens i just genuinely get excited about it and i and you know sometimes one time i was talking about one of the players and i was like man i love this player or whatever and they're like james you love all the players and i was like this is just because they're all so good and i just yeah. like genuinely get excited and you know uh i've been in it for so long and I, I I want people to enjoy fighting games, and mm. so you know that it's one of the reasons why I want to do commentary so much is because I just want to get people to enjoy the games. I just want people to see why they're so fun. You know, back when Street Fighter V before it came out, one of the best things that Capcom ever did was make Mike Ross and and Combo Fiend keep playing those matches, like when they were showing Mika off and stuff, and like Mike was getting so mad at Mika, and you can hear like the the crew laughing and everything, like, and it's just it shows why fighting games are fun, and that's that's the main thing that I, I want to do for commentary. Um, I guess in terms of challenging, you know, it's. It's weird because you're putting yourself out there, and I, I've always been this weird introverted mm. extrovert or something like that. You know, like even when I was a kid, when we put on school plays, I would always take the lead role with the most lines and everything like that. Well, I think people have the wrong idea of what an introvert and extrovert is because yeah. really all it is is about how you recharge. So, like mm. an extrovert gets their energy from people. And an introvert has to go, all right, I need to go <laughs> sit in my room for a bit now. Yes. And, and that's how I recharge. And, but people have taken extrovert to mean like, I'm loud and I'm out there and I'm yeah. this and I'm that. And both you and me can do that. Mm -hmm. But I know I'm an introvert. Yeah. I know that there's a point where I go, I'm out because mm -hmm. I'm dead. I yeah. can't hang out with you guys. Yeah. So I, I have a thing that I call introvert fatigue where we're, we're hanging out with a bunch of people and I'll be talkative and everything. And then all of a sudden, like partway through the conversation, all of a sudden I just shut yeah. down yeah. and I'm yeah. just looking at my I phone know. and I'm like, you know what? I just need to go to my room. I, I, I just, that. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, so. I, I'm that guy, like, I don't know if there's other, other people like this, but like sometimes I'll be at Evo and I'll be, I'll go to my bedroom and watch it. <laughs> from my bedroom right no and I'm like wait I paid thousands you know like I paid thousands of dollars for this whole thing yeah. and I'm in the bedroom <laughs> like, I mean to be honest it's one of the reasons why like uh, me and David work so well because he kind of has a little bit of the same thing and so a yeah. lot of times after the tournament we just go back to the room we Joe. don't even talk to each yeah. other like yeah. we're just hanging there and it's like it's great you know kind of yeah. thing so yeah and I understand that so uh, all right so the strengths and weaknesses work do you have like a favorite memory in commentary uh you probably have a lot um and then i'll probably ask you for your worst experience so let's think let's think about let's, maybe like your one of your best experience your best experience and your worst experience interesting uh i mean honestly you know best experience 
I mean, it, it's it's a weird one because like I hate when I get emotional at Evo, but ah, at the same time, okay. you know, I get emotional because it means so much yeah. to me. And when Tokido says like it meant so much to him, I feel like yeah. that's like oh, see. I mean, I've always told everyone the reason why I got so emotional when Tokido said that is because that man's a legit genius, right? Mm-hmm. He got a Tokyo University, could have did anything he wanted to in life and been successful, mm-hmm. and he did fighting games. And when he won Evo, and he's like, fighting games are something so great. I'm mm-hmm. just like you know for him it was worth it Mm. you know that whole journey was worth it and doing everything into me that just like it hit me right in the feels Mm. you know and so you know i mean that was probably you know one of the more memorable ones um uh in terms of like bad experiences with commentary i mean i know there's like lots of different like little small things maybe but so all right let me like you have to i imagine that a bad experience in commentary might involve, I don't know, let me pick some stuff here, uh, not understanding what's going on in the brackets, which apparently still happens uh, in this day and age, which is really bizarre to me because I can't believe that's still happening. Uh, potentially not knowing the names of like little technical things. Uh, potentially, obviously, this one is a little bit more contentious because, like, you don't want to name any names, but like being paired up with like the wrong, getting the wrong oh, chemistry yeah. going, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Because it's you know, it's your sort of, it's in the end, it's sort of your real. Like, even if it doesn't end up on your real, mm-hmm. it's still out there. It's still in a moment where some people are seeing you for the first time. Like, like you, you must have you had those experiences where you're just like get me out of here <laughs> no uh, to be honest with you i mean if i think back at it like i can't pick a specific moment or anything but early on during commentary you know you're streaming to a very small group of people or whatever so you're reading the chat the whole entire time and everything like that and probably some of the hardest ones there was a period of time where you know my commentary i just started you know, trying to be knowledgeable without understanding things. And I was saying things that weren't necessarily accurate, but, Uh, but I was like, I want to make it sound like I'm authoritative. So I'm just saying things, you know, Oh, this thing is punishable and it wasn't punishable. You know, like, (laughs) you know, you say these kind of things and, you know, eventually it got to the point where I had a really low period of time where just like everybody hated me. Right. Like everybody was mad. And so like I would read the chat and there's Mm. just like during commentary, people would just be like, this guy is an idiot and all this stuff and you know like i said i'm super hard on myself and so like when you read that it's just it's so hard to to handle and like you know when you read that like i can feel myself shut down sometimes on commentary where like i just don't say anything anymore you know and like i said they and you know i've i've made sure to try to fix that i've now if i'm not sure i just say i don't know you know and or and i've even told now we can say like hey chat tell us (laughs) exactly (laughs) tweet me tweet me the information (laughs) but i used to be really declarative about things like oh this is this and yeah Yeah. this is a bad matchup it's not even a bad match you know like And, 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 you know, I was very public about it, too. I was like, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to change this. I know you guys are, like, all really down on me right now, but I'll fix this. And, you know, and I started focusing on back to the, I don't, you know, not necessarily authority, trying to be authoritative on knowledge, but just more like on, I know my strength is the psychology, you know, where what people understand what they're thinking during the game. I've had a lot of people come up to me and they're like, man, I watched a commentary and what you said about what I was thinking is exactly what I was thinking. You know, I'm, I'm like really keen on that kind of thing. And so I've started to focus on that. And I think it's more fascinating anyway, because to me, it's never going to be about the game. It's always going to be about the players. Mm. They're always going to be the most important people. So, like, when Dragon Ball came out, Sonic Fox Goichi drove the narrative of Dragon Ball. Storylines. Right? And, right. And, 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 and Goichi entered MK11 here. And so, like, you're just like, yo, he's still going after Sonic. Like, it doesn't matter what game they're playing. Yeah. It's always about the players, so I, I, I would almost rather talk about the players now. So when yeah. I do commentary, I'm more just about like, oh, this, look at this guy. He looks so, you know, confused yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Or like, these guys had this history or yeah. this. And yeah. I, I, I love the human aspect of fighting games yeah. so much. And that's kind of like what I like to focus on these days. I mean, definitely there's a lot of like technical knowledge that I'd like to impart to yeah, people yeah, because yeah. I just want them to understand what's going on. But... I'm not trying to be like the authority or be like that guy who knows all the frame data because that's impossible anyway. <laughs> well, it's also, I mean, that 
that uh, the frame data piece, like there's only so much of, you, of that you can do before it gets pretty boring. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a small portion of probably nowadays, it's a much smaller portion of the viewing population who care. Like they like, they do like the storylines. They do like the people. They do like psychology. That's why I do interviews, right? You know, and I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't sit here asking people about, you know, <laughs> what do you think about that move that can punish this move or that move? Like, that's not what I care about. I care about the people and and helping create the storylines yeah, in a way or help people get to know people. So James actually has to go. Uh, he has to do commentary. We have to wrap this up right now. We can talk forever. We will talk again. It's uh, sadly I fucked up and we actually <laughs> recorded something quite funny believe it or not and uh and uh yeah so thank you for yeah. your time i mean look uh, again I, I wish we could you know i can talk forever you know not just even about the fighting game stuff but you know i know recently you've been talking about like the emotions the depression that kind mm -hmm. of thing it's a topic that is very near and dear to my heart as well so you know uh, I would love to talk about that. I feel like it's a conversation that needs to get out there and people need to talk about it more. So, I'm 100% with that. I was saying before when it didn't get recorded <laughs> that I'm at that age, we're at that age. Your birthday is written in mine, by the way. Yeah. Uh, we're at that age where we just don't actually give a fuck. And <laughs> it's kind of it's like the end of Eminem, 8 Mile, where he's like, yeah, like I do live with my mom, I am white trash, you know. You did jump me, blah blah blah. But I don't, I don't care anymore. So like, what, 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 do you, what you got? What you got? So that's how I feel about it, to be honest. Like I'm an open book. So yeah. let's definitely have that conversation. Sure. Uh, thank you again. Yeah. Good luck with the commentary, and we'll continue this soon. And uh, if any of you guys want to leave a comment down below, uh, go for it. And uh, maybe a question that you want in the next, yeah. in the next part, the next part of this. Com subscribe. conversation <laughs> yeah and, <laughs> and subscribe uh all right see you later guys hey guys little outro from me if you enjoyed the interview or any content that i do i'm not gonna sugarcoat it at all youtube is abysmal right now particularly in the ftc for uh for making any type of ad revenue so i do actually need direct support from you guys direct financial support again no sugarcoating guys this is it uh, last chance saloon for me so you can support me via patreon in the link below or you can come to my stream you can support me via twitch subs or donations uh, again links below i stream pretty regularly big thank you to my patrons that are on screen right now the trend is going up more and more people are joining uh, i will Verbally shout out Domingo, Stephen Sense, Terence Harris, and Alan Cabada for being my top four patrons. But all of you are making a difference. You have no idea. And like I said, the trend is only going up. So that's really looking good at the moment. Twitch subs and donations. You guys get shout outs on stream, of course. Now, this is all part of a six-week experiment. If you haven't already watched the video, the video will be at the end of this of this video. You can click on it. Um, interviews, streaming, and comedy skits are what I do, We're along with other stuff. But let me know in your comments what you are supporting. That's really important to me, to understand what it is that you are supporting. And maybe it's all three, I don't know. Patreon's a bit of a mess right now. I will sort it out, and I may make some tiers and allow people to uh, have more influence on my work, or at least talk to me about it, stuff like that, depending on what tier you're in. In the meantime, come to the Discord. There's a whole section where you can give me suggestions, thoughts, feedback, you know, who do you want to see interviewed, stuff like that. Um, this may or may not be the end of my FGC content creation. Either way, it's fine. I just don't want to be in limbo. I think you guys can probably understand that, right? And uh, so we'll see what happens. And that's it. Peace out, guys. Love you lots.